Okay, great. So, hi, I'm John Deal. I'm the CEO of Nine Power. We're based out of Denver. Uh, we're the commercialization vehicle for some new technology that was actually developed at the Los Alamos National Laboratory in, in New Mexico. And I want to talk to you today about some of the one of the biggest problems that the oil and gas industry faces. And I knew this was going to happen. When it starts blinking at you, I think it means the battery is better. Let's try that. It's a sink called produced water which is actually water that comes back up out of a well uh, with oil and gas. And uh, it's a result of drilling, even things like fracking, but mostly production and then some in refinery. Um, this volume of water is so great that a lot of people refer to uh, oil recovery as water recovery with a little oil thrown in. Because the amount of toxic water that comes back up out of that oil well is 5 to 40 times as much as the oil that you get out of the ground. It's highly toxic, and it represents about 98% of the waste for the entire industry. And globally, the oil and gas industry spends about $40 billion on it. It's quite a lot of money and a lot of effort dealing with that. Now, here in northern Colorado, we certainly talk a lot about production oil and frac fluid and things like that. So this fits right in there uh, and helps provide a solution for that. So that's the problem. And the, the issue around produced water is that it's got a lot of different junk in it, and it's based on sort of what's under the ground. So it's going to have some salt in it. Uh, it's going to have various particles in it. But more importantly, it's going to have dissolved hydrocarbons. So this is, by definition, all produced water from oil and gas will have parts of the hydrocarbons you're pulling out of the ground in there. And it's difficult to grab those hydrocarbons because they're volatile and because they're dissolved inside of the produced water. So salt pretty easy to deal with. There's a bunch of different methods from really inexpensive all the way up to very expensive. Um, particles, you could just use a sand filter or something like that to grab it. But it's these, again, these hydrocarbons that are very, very difficult to grab out of this produced water. Organic hydrocarbons, again, show up in all produced water. They're carcinogenic. They include things like benzene and toluene. Uh, when you pump gas into your car, you smell this kind of you know, really acrid smell. That's benzene, right? So that's what's in this water, in addition to a bunch of other things. And again, they're soluble in water, which means that they dissolve and they, they kind of bond to the water, so it's not easy to just let the oil float to the top. Uh, mostly because there's, uh, you know, they have such a low specific gravity and such a low weight. So this is typical produced water, and you can see it's got some floaters in there and some other things. And this is water that's been treated. About eight years ago, the University of Texas New Mexico Tech and Los Alamos National Laboratory came together and said they wanted to figure out a way to deal with these dissolved organic hydrocarbons inside of produced water from oil and gas. And they put together a program, and all of you are part owners in this new technology because it was done on your tax dollars. Um, under the Los Alamos and the, and the Department of Energy Technology Commercialization Program, Nine Power has been selected to commercialize that technology. There were two drivers. One is economic, which is purely you know, the older the wells get, the more watery they get. And so the oil and gas companies are looking for a solution for how to treat produced water. And then there's obviously an ecological one. Because if you just dispose of the water, put it back down in the ground, then you're going to, you know, risk the chance of, of uh, screwing up the local water supply. But also, you know, this water is a, is a great resource. And if you can clean it cheap enough and treat it to the point uh, where there's none of these organic hydrocarbons left in the water, you could use it to water crops and for livestock. So it's a new source of water in you know, what's really a water-stressed uh, global environment. So what was developed is this thing called organic clear. It's based on uh, a modified organo clay. This is just something you dig out of the ground and then a surfactant is applied to it. And what that allows it to do is it grabs the hydrocarbons on the one hand, that allows you to recharge it on the other, which is kind of cool because if you use other methods of filtering out organic hydrocarbons like granulated activated carbon, you know, those pure water filters, you can't get the hydrocarbons off the filter media. Yeah, you can sure pass it around. And it's not toxic or anything. You can open it up if you'd like. Um, don't drink it, though. I don't, I'm not sure that's a good idea. Um, so, so what was it all? Again, it's this organic clear system. It comes into... A canister is about this tall and this around and it's full of this stuff and you run water through it and then once you get to the point where the filter media is totally kind of consumed 
all the organics it can, you recharge it, and you can do this very simply using just an air compressor. So that means that we can get a cold system that'll work out in the field, and it cleans water for between 25 and 50 cents a barrel, which is 42 gallons. That compares to a buck and a half to five, sometimes seven dollars a barrel to just dump it and into a deep ejection well. So this is obviously cheaper, it's better, it's reusable, which is all sort of the things that you want if you want to commercialize a new product, a cheaper, faster, better kind of paradigm. This is what the canister looks like out in the field. You can tell it's simple. Uh, there's some uh, salt filters behind it. And we can also can hook a bioreactor. So when you blow out the hydrocarbons, when you're recharging uh, filter media, we've got bugs, a special bug colony that eat those hydrocarbons. So there's absolutely no waste. Now some people don't have regulations that require you to grab those aromatics when they come off of a filter system like this. Uh, Montana is a good example. Colorado does, famously. We have great emission standards here. So this is a sort of a uh, flexible addition that you can put onto the system. This is a bit of an architectural drawing, but you know, this is the oil water separator. Here's our product, these three things here. And again, it's something that fits on a four by four pallet and will process around anywhere between 10 and 20 gallons a minute, which if you do the math and run it over you know, the course of, of a day, that's quite a substantial amount of water. It gets up and around 3,000 barrels a day uh, you know, uh, volume. So what we remove is kind of a lot, and I think the, the one thing I'll draw your attention to is that we remove not only metal, but also biological organisms in addition to these dissolved hydrocarbons. There's also something chemical called chemical and biological oxygen band, and you see aerators a lot on these little ponds, even up down at 85, these little bubblers. This absolves you from having had them, having to use that so that you don't bubble all the hydrocarbons into the air and sort of pollute the air with, you know, with produced water by holding it in some kind of open tank. We've got a bunch of competitive features here, but the bottom line is that we, in this case, we, we refer to this whole class as BTEX, that stands for benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, xylene. Those are the hard to remove organic hydrocarbons. And we'll give you back usable water. Unlike other things, we've got a rechargeable filter media, which means lower cost and uh, the ability to, uh, you know, essentially eliminate waste off of cleaning this kind of water. Off-the-shelf components mean that we have a lower capital cost and a lot of specialized equipment that's made, you know, whether it's paper filters or specifically ground kind of carbon. And then also we've got this high chemistry and environmental tolerance, unlike a lot of other systems. Any water can go in. It can be near freezing all the way up to near boiling, and our system will, will filter this hydrocarbon down. So again, there's two things that what we call the SMZ reactor, that stands for surfactant modified zeolite. That's what that little jar is. And then also the vapor phase bioreactor, which again, again eliminates toxins and also uh, leaves you with no toxic waste stream. The market drivers are kind of obvious. There's an increased global water demand, but also the regulations are getting more and more difficult. Part of this has to do with public awareness of how drilling works and how oil recovery works. So as those regulatory hurdles increase, the oil and gas companies are forced to do a better job of putting water and they can't just, can't just dump it. Um, uh, again, I think the other thing that's, that's uh, telling is when I talk to oil and gas companies, they say, look, we live on this planet too. You know, we're not out to just pollute the planet. So we'd love to have something that would allow us to treat our water and do so in a manner that's cheap enough for it not to screw up our you know, our, our cost margin. If you look globally, our markets are really in these heavy areas of oil extraction that also have water scarcity. And you can see that's, that's here in the US, the West Coast, Latin America. But it's predominantly in Middle East, Africa, and parts of China. So how are we going to get there? Well, first you have to look at sort of the competitive landscape. There are other ways to filter out produced water. Uh, distillation is very difficult for people to afford because essentially you're boiling water and you're eating your profits. Other absorption media, like activated carbon, there's no way to recharge it, so it ends up in a landfill. You're sort of just moving the problem. Incineration, like distillation, requires a lot of energy. 
Biofilters are kind of neat, but they're very difficult. You have to build a specific biofilter for a specific uh, kind of produced water. So it's, it's a lot of biology. It turns out to be very expensive. Wetlands is what we use in Colorado a lot, and you'll see again these ponds of water near oil wells. And the, the idea is that it just evaporates, but then you leave all these nasty toxins sitting there in the soil. There are artificial filter systems from a French company like Veolia, um, and they use plastic beads uh, instead of this organo clay. The problem with that is that they have to have high pressure steam to clean the hydrocarbons off, and we just use compressed air, so we've got a lower cost for the plot. So, in terms of our company development, um, you know, there's a few, few key activities that we have to perform. First of all, manufacturing organic layers pretty well uh, been done, and I'll talk a little bit about how we got there. Our intent is to sell via some dedicated sales, but mostly to use the existing industry suppliers. These are folks that provide equipment to the oil and gas industry uh, at the production <coughs> level. And then also use the oil, and, uh, oil field service firms to service uh, you know, our equipment as it's needed. And the, I think the, the last thing that's important to note here is that our intent is to use uh, joint ventures to go global. So we don't have to have $100 million of capital to make a big impact. And our goal as a company is obviously to make money, but also our charge from the Department of Energy is to spread the technology, and spread it organic clear as far and wide as possible. There's additional markets which we kind of just stumbled on recently, and that's still clean up uh, waste remediation from existing, say, uh, city dumps, and then also household treatment where they've had some kind of intrusion of hydrocarbon. In terms of corporate development, we spent the last couple of years securing the intellectual property from Los Alamos. We've now got control of the patents and the patent portfolio surrounding the technology. We've done engineering on a production unit and build, built several commercial units, and we're beginning commercial test Colorado, Montana, and actually Mexico with Pemex, which is kind of neat because uh, virtually every oil well in Mexico requires one of our units. It, it's going to need one of our units, and so these early tests will all just become a standard down there. Um, the team has been together quite a while. Some of us have been working together for 20 years. As you can see, we've got a broad set of experience from IBM, the Los Alamos, uh, computer industry, Lockheed Martin, Sandia, and we've worked together on several of these ventures. Essentially, I've got four partners in the company. I've got a development guy, science officer, marketing person, salesperson, and then a CFO. And we've been doing this, we've worked together on three other startups, so you know, we're pretty familiar with how we work and, and how things get done. That means this small team can actually come together to do a, a wide variety of different kinds of startups. Right now we're focused on treating produced water. Our strategic partners include BioNano Consulting out of the UK, that's connected up with uh, Imperial College and University College in London, and of course Los Alamos, these are suppliers. CGRS is a local company here that does engineering services. Van Or is a Dutch company that provides heavy equipment when that's needed at uh, oil and gas points for us. And NTS is our automation company out of Albuquerque. Our financial plan is pretty direct. It's, you know, we're starting out here with nearly zero in revenue, a couple million dollars, and then over the next five years, we think we'll get to an annual you know, sale of around 60 million bucks. We've got a lot, since we're competitively priced, you know, we, we kind of pick 25 to 50 cents uh, as a competitive cost per barrel. That's not nearly what it costs us, and it includes a very healthy bottom line for us. What that means is that we can afford to install units for a lot cheaper for, say, communities in Africa than what we would charge the oil industry. And we can do that, uh, have some flexibility there. Will we be able to maintain a 35% EBITDA? Probably not. <laughs> but we've got a lot of room to move around in there. So the capital we're looking for is a total of $5 million over the next two years. We're expecting to close on a million and a half this year. This is to put initial manufacturing sales together. Um, and then we're looking to an exit in year four. I put five here just because I think it's a much more reasonable thing to do. And, you know, since we're, we've, we're, we're going to consume around five and a half million dollars, you've got a $60 million sales uh, or revenue figure, it's pretty easy to justify, you know, getting somewhere between eight and twelve 
uh, X in terms of an ROI for those investors. So, in terms of risk, there's definitely risk in every uh, venture like this, but you know, we feel like that the team lowers the risk. The fact that we've got a very simple design and off-the-shelf components that come together to create our product, and that we have a very, very well understood proven market. And because they have to get oil leases, we actually can just call them up. It's not like you know, oil and gas producers or some unknown entity. Um, it's pretty, pretty obvious who those people are. So finding our potential customers is not that difficult. So finally, uh, Bluebird and New Energy Finance says that the produced water is going to continue to grow. We've already got a $40 billion a year annual problem. It's supposed to go <laughs> grow 25% per year uh, you know, for the next uh, seven or eight years. That's quite a lot of growth, and we hope to, to ride that up some. We don't have to be a major player in the $40 billion a year market in order to be wildly successful for a little company in Colorado. That's it.